Hello, welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you here. And uh, as we, uh, you know, are in the habit of doing every week, because we don't assume that people listen to us every week, we're going to introduce ourselves. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church here in the Pacific Northwest. I've written a few books. I've been a professor of uh, philosophy. And I've got a, a new thing coming out, a new, a new uh, little booklet coming out entitled Post Woke, My Journey from Social Justice to Household Economics. And that'll be out in just a few weeks, I think. Maybe a few months. But anyway, I'm, I'm putting the final touches on it. But enough about me. Why don't we go to you, Tom, and then to Glenn, and then we'll introduce our guest. I'm Tom Price. I um, systematic, teach systematic theology, uh, Christian ethics, philosophy, and even uh, religion in America as of now <laughs> at a variety of institutions, uh, one of which is Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. I am a ministry associate with Reflections Ministries and a retired history professor. And you're there in South Bend, Indiana. And we've got a guest today who's also in Indiana, but a couple hours away from you. And this yep. is Aaron Wren. Aaron, uh, it's great to have you on the show. You, you've, you've been with us a couple of other times. Good to have you back. It's been a little while. I think the last time we were we were with you, we were in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, in a pizzeria, and right. uh, we had we had a good, we had a good time there. I but always thought that it? this was supposed to be recorded in a pub somewhere. And <laughs> we seem to have take, uh, declined uh, from the peak of uh, podcast. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you're right. Yeah, we're all spread out now, and so now now we're we are in a virtual pub. Uh, <laughs> we do get together every once in a while. But uh, why don't you tell us what you've been up to, because you've been up to a lot uh, since you've last been with us. Sure. So I am a writer uh, about Christianity and culture. I have a Substack page, which is where I'm doing most of that today. It's aaronren.substack.com, A-A-R-O-N-R-E-N-N.substack.com. But I write for a variety of other publications uh, as well. Uh, And then I also work uh, on men's lifestyle um, media uh, for an outfit called New Founding Corporation. Uh, so I've uh, got kind of a feet in, in kind of two different worlds uh, there. Uh, but I've had a couple other careers before this, but prior to really focusing on Christian issues, I spent a lot of time doing urban policy research and writing, particularly about Rust Belt cities at the Manhattan Institute uh, and elsewhere. Still do a little bit of that. And uh, then prior to that, I was a technology and management consultant for many years with a firm called Accenture. Uh, which is still out there today. Great firm. And that's me. Well, I listen to you regularly on your podcast, and a lot of the stuff that you address is really refreshing uh, to hear from you know, someone who's kind of tied into the circles that, w- that we're tied into. Uh, I think you have a, a body of experience that gives you, I think, a, uh, an ability to see some things that a lot of folks who are kind of part of what you might call you know, mo- movement conservatism uh, are unaware of. And so it's been really helpful to listen to the podcast and kind of get some some insight into kind of the nuances of at least conservatism, but also how conservatism has related maybe well or not so well with politics and with urban issues and cultural movements and so forth. Anyway, uh, the reason why, you know, we're, we have you on the show today is you've written a few, couple of things for First Things. And First Things uh, for our listening audience, in case they don't know, is probably the most important uh, journal of Religion and Public Life in the world, at least in the English-speaking world. I mean, Supreme Court justices read it. Uh, my understanding is the Pope has a subscription. <laughs> so it's a pretty big deal to be to be he in first should, things. Be reading it. And you wrote an article. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Well, maybe I'm thinking about an earlier Pope. <laughs> but anyway, you you had a you had an, an article recently entitled "The Three Worlds of Evangelicalism." that really created a stir and challenges a number of assumptions people uh, have been working uh, with and from. Would you mind just kind of giving us a, a, a description of what you talked about in that article? And uh, we can kind of use that as a launching point to get into some things. Sure. That article was in the February 2022 issue of First Things magazine. It is an update of a framework that I originally came up with in 2014 and wrote down in my newsletter in 2017, uh, which looks at the fundamental change that has occurred in the way that secular culture relates to Christianity 
And in addition to that, I also provide some sort of sociological analysis, if you will, of the various groups within evangelicalism to try to explain how these changes in the world have helped lead to this tremendous uh, dispute and debate within the evangelical world. Uh, so those are sort of the two parts. You can take or leave uh, either one if you don't find them useful, but many, many people have found my framework uh, helpful. And this is where the consulting background comes in because consultants love frameworks. Now, I couldn't quite fit it into a two-by-two -two matrix, which is uh, what a lot of people would do, so maybe I'm getting rusty. But what I posit is that since the high watermark of church attendance in the 1950s in America, uh, um, you know, Christianity status within society has been fundamentally eroding. And as that erosion uh, occurred, we went through two tipping points, which divide that period into three distinct eras or worlds that I label the positive, the neutral, and the negative world. And yet I would say this really explains kind of post-1960s America. Once you get pre-1960s, the divisions are more denominational, Catholic, Protestant, et cetera. The landscape's a little different. Uh, but once you get past 50s, 60s, into this period of Christian decline, we have these three worlds. And these labels refer to the way in which secular elite culture and the essentially official cultural institutions of society treat and view Christianity. So in the positive world, these still viewed Christianity in essentially a positive manner. Uh, in the neutral world, uh, these uh, institutions no longer view Christianity positively, but they don't view it negatively either. It's seen as a socially neutral attribute. Um, it's much like a hobby or affectation, being a Christian. I always say, meet somebody and you say, I'm a Christian. They'd say, oh, great, I'm a vegan. Let's sit down and talk. And then uh, we moved into this era that I call the negative world, where for the first time in the 400-year history of America, you know, secular culture, especially at the elite levels, has come to view Christianity in an essentially negative way. To be known as a Christian hurts you socially, particularly in the more prestigious domains of society. Christian morality is expressly repudiated, and it is even seen as a threat to the new public order. And so I divide these in terms of dates, uh, pre-1994, the positive world, 1994 to 2014, the neutral world, and then post-2014, the negative world. And again, there's nothing magical about those dates. Uh, if you like the concept but not the dates, by all means, pick your own. But I think one reason this article has resonated so much and this framework has resonated so much over the years with people I've shared it with is because people do have this sense that something has fundamentally changed in society, that the way Christianity and culture interacted has changed, there has been a shift, and therefore many of the old formulas and strategies and approaches don't work like they used to. And so people are sort of grappling for what to do about that. And one of the things I argue is that the church, especially the evangelical church, has not really come up with a, an approach that is appropriate to the current time. But maybe I will stop right there and we can dialogue about the framework. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great framework, uh, particularly for understanding kind of the situation on the ground that many pastors and lay people would uh, ex you know, feel. You know, we, we talk an awful lot on our show about kind of the intellectual antecedents to some of these things that go back a long way. But all of that, you know, the stuff that we talk about is just sort of like ivory tower stuff to most folks. They, they're like, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, you think ideas matter. And, you know, but, you know, on the ground when I was a kid, everybody was a Christian, so on and so forth. But I think everybody, I, in fact, I haven't come across anybody who doesn't think that the ground has shifted at, at a fundamental sort of social level. So I think that your your analysis and, and your, your kind of typology or, or categorizations are, are really good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, re I remember as, as a student in, you know, in, in uh, starting university as someone who was, con you know, converted to Christianity, 
And I remember a very strong, this was had to be the 80s, um, around late 80s, early 90s. There was a very strong antithesis in the university between modernism and then the kind of cultural fundamentalism. But there was within the the wider culture, like you said, a certain kind of um, positive relationship going on there, at least towards kind of morality or, or you know, uh, you know, uh, that people who tended to be Christians tended to aim towards a good life and and contribute something beneficial. Um, But you did have very strong criticisms, um, you know, of the ideas that I think were starting to spill over even into the attitudes of, you know, people I worked with and everything else that had the same kind of patterns of thought, of criticism of Christianity. But then I remember around uh, graduate school, um, you know, when post-modernity started to kind of become more popular, there was at first this kind of hopefulness that maybe evangelicals were now going to have a place back in that uh, that world that was given over to you know almost an exclusive enlightenment um, vision. Yeah, I remember all kinds of I can remember all kinds of kind of silly sounding now uh, you know statements. We're going to get back to the table. Yeah, well, we've got a place Rich, too. The Richard Rorty view of <laughs> postmodernity, if you will, the pragmatic view that somehow this is going to um, get away from worldview fighting or ideas fighting and get back into constructive communities, you know. But then what you had is this kind of what I would, you know, what I think was a worry of of Rorty is a religious turn in the postmodern world, which became very dogmatic now and and brought that kind of radical modernist. Um, alternative humanism against kind of Christianity to to almost a new almost a new kind of secular fundamentalism, you know, the social justice world and and the like. And so, what you do is you have a very strange cocktail of things going on. But like you said, large scale, you're seeing a very negative cultural attitude towards anything to do with Christianity, especially its linkages in any way positive to the enlightenment and, and anything therein. Anyway, I just, that's some of the things that come to mind just experientially going through those different phases. You bring up something very important. Uh, A lot of people who like to critique my framework will say, well, the professors were always anti-Christian. The university's always been anti-Christian. And you could go back hundreds of years and find many intellectual elites, social elites who were Mm -hmm. anti-Christian. You could think about many of our founding fathers, for example, who were only dubiously Christian, may have been deist, not really clear what they believed. But in the realm of sort of public culture and morality, Christianity and its values held sway, and they had to give some homage to that. These people were not setting the entire cultural agenda yeah. Even if, to some extent, the culture of you know New York intellectual elites uh, was you know not really into that, and you can see this, I think, very clearly in three different sex scandals, uh, which I <laughs> originally included in the piece but did not make it to the final version. <laughs> I think three political sex scandals illustrate this. 1987, it was reported by the Miami Herald that Senator Gary Hart from Colorado had a young woman staying overnight in his townhouse in D.C. He was running for president at the time, widely considered a front runner, and he had to drop out of the race. Yeah, I think he's maintained he did nothing wrong, but merely the appearance of impropriety did him in. Fast forward to the neutral world, 1998. Uh, Drudge Report breaks the story that Bill Clinton has been having an affair with Monica Lewinsky in the mm-hmm. Oval Office. Clinton is very badly damaged by that scandal, but all the Democrats sort of rallied around him and said, you know, his public uh, ability to do the job is not affected by his private moral behavior. That's kind of his own business. It was consensual, et cetera. And then you fast forward to 2016, Donald Trump's running for president. They try to drop an October surprise on him with the Access Hollywood tape in which he made any number of crude comments about women. And that was like a 48-hour blip of a scandal. And, you know, Donald Trump's, you know, notorious philandering and all of his behaviors, which were completely at odds with traditional Christian morality, really had no effect on people's willingness to vote for him. And so I think that does show that something has shifted, that even sort of a popular Democratic politician in the 80s, uh, 
had to drop out of the presidential race if, yeah, if it was right. believed that he did something inappropriate sexually. That's just completely, uh, no matter what the university people were thinking about Christianity, right. Christianity definitely had a control at some level of the public moral sphere at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, it's, and I think one of the things that, that some of our younger listeners may may have no ability to relate to, uh, you know, the worlds that, uh, you know, we grew up in, uh, that we experienced, uh, were, uh, suffused with certain, uh, you know, strong, strong prohibitions about, you know, kinds of certain kinds of behavior. A lot of that, if not all of it is gone, at least, at least in a, in a public, in the public right. sphere, I think at a, at the private level, you know, people still want everybody to kind of follow certain rules of, you know, behavior, particularly with, if you're married and things like that, you shouldn't be sleeping around. And, uh, generally speaking, unless you're in some strange swinger setting, <laughs> but, uh, generally, uh, that, that, that again, you get, you got this huge sort of divide between the public and the private. Whereas what we were talking about is something that was pretty public once, um, and, and considered, uh, important to, to support. Yeah, it, looking back at this historically, I mean, even if you look at the uh, the deists among the founding fathers, they assumed Christian morality. Um, it was as simple as that. Now, you, Ben Franklin was quite a philanderer, but uh, and, and so were some of the others. But they they more or less assumed that Christian moral standards would be the norm. Um, I was in college in the late seventies. And I remember this was um, just the point in which uh, the gay movement was really getting started on college campuses. And I remember the discussion surrounding them. But I, you know, among my professors, well, l- l- let me give you an example. I-, I took a number of Bible classes from a professor who described himself as a 19th century liberal existentialist with orthodox tendencies. <laughs> <laughs> I memorized that because I thought that was, you know, and so he he would um he would spend time you know talking about higher criticism and all of that of scripture and then there were these obnoxious students like me who would argue with him about it in class you know and point out the problems and things along these lines a couple of years later after i'd taken the classes i bumped into him and was talking to him in his office and he looked at me with this rather confused, perplexed, and worried look. And he said, Glenn, where have all the intelligent conservative students gone? Mm. He says, I used to be able to talk about, you know, second Isaiah and right. count on, and then I would always pause because there would always be a student in the class who would give the alternate viewpoint. Mm-hmm. They're not there anymore. What happened to them? Right. And what, what I find interesting about that in, in this context is that I although, thought there were supposed to be three Isaiahs. <laughs> well, yeah, we, 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 were, we were just dealing with two okay, at that point. Okay. I didn't even know there was supposed to be an Isaiah, but anyway. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but, but, but a very liberal, religiously liberal professor was more than open for conservative viewpoints in class and that kind of thing. These days, well, by the time he was done, he hadn't realized that he'd done his work too well. And all the conservative students, most of them were, frankly, just simply scared off and didn't want to take his classes. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, Harvey Cox. Uh, Harvey Cox was the guy that got me uh, into Harvard Divinity. And he was actively, uh, you know, recruiting evangelicals to go to Harvard. In fact, he tried to get Mark Knoll on the faculty there and the faculty voted him down. But, you know, he was a celebrity liberal. I mean, you know, at at any time he, you know, if he wanted to get into the Atlantic, if he wanted to get into the New York Times, it it was like no problem. And no one, he was untouchable, but he confided to me that he was against gay marriage. And, uh, he actually took a stand in, this is the, this is the mid nineties, took a stand against it at Harvard Divinity School and no one dared to challenge him on it. Uh, today he'd be canceled for sure. Uh, if he, now he's retired, <laughs> he's set, <laughs> you know, he, he's out of the picture, but, uh, that's the world that we knew, uh, you know, you know, in the positive world and neutral world that you could still have a guy like Harvey Cox 
who had, uh, you know, a liberal pedigree that could not be challenged, who was uh, willing to make those kinds of statements and stands. It's, that's all gone. Right. Yeah. You know, it really uh, stunning the low levels of moral courage in any dimension of society today yeah. uh, among the elite. So I use this example. It's not in the article. Here in Indianapolis, um, the former head of the library system here, she had been a city councilor. She had been the most liberal city councilor by far, liberal Democrat. She is the one that had introduced and pushed through all of the gay rights ordinances, you know, well before it became popular uh, nationally, and especially in a place like Indiana, that was a controversial stand. You know, she rescued uh, a community development corporation serving a majority black neighborhood. She herself lives in a majority black neighborhood. I mean, she has impeccable credentials. And uh, she was uh, appointed head of the library board or head of the library system. Uh, some employee there said she was running a plantation, ran to the paper, accused her of like running a plantation, and she was forced out. And not one person in this community, all of these leaders who are her close personal friends, who know her character, who know that that is a ridiculous statement, all of them remain silent. All of yeah. them. And it, they, they, and this has nothing to do with Christianity. This just goes to show the sort of, you know, Orwellian in, ideological and intellectual climate that exists in America. And I think it does show that how little moral courage it are possessed by the American elite today. They are yeah, a, yeah. as craven a collection of people as you can possibly imagine. They love to take these quote unquote prophetic stands yeah. when they're really just, you know, kind of repping the party line against unpopular right. people. But when it might cost them something, most of them, uh, you know, keep their mouth shut. And it's, it's really uh, astonishing. Yeah. Let's think a little bit about, uh, kind of the, these transitions. So you, you, you make some, um, I think pretty, uh, you know, sort of undeniable, you know, observations about these phases. Uh, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on, you know, what's contributed to these things at a social level, not, not just at the idea level, because we've already talked about the fact that the ideas have been floating around for hundreds of years and didn't sink into the popular culture. What, what's helped, helped this sort of along, do you think? Well, in essence, there's been a slow liquidation of intermediate institutions and social capital in America. Uh, I think that's very clear. Uh, you could read Bowling Alone, of the, you know, all the work of you know uh, Robert Putnam and, and the many people. So we used to have institutions, intermediary institutions, that uh, you know, sort of were culture-bearing institutions and buffers against some of this stuff. They've essentially all gone away. Uh, I certainly think the uh, the fall of the you know WASP establishment, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant establishment, had a lot to do with it. Not for nothing was there a Protestant in that. The Protestantism was a part of their identity, their cultural identity. And as the uh, you know leadership class of America, you know they essentially continued to defend Protestantism. Now, that was liberal Protestantism. This was certainly not evangelical Protestantism. It's not fundamentalism. Sure. Many of these people were not religious, really, in a, in a material way. Uh, but yet, Protestantism was very bound up with their identity. Uh, and so that sort of um, was something of a, uh, a buffer against any sort of anti-Christian ideas seeping in. You know, you know there could be liberal Christianity for sure, but a, a sort of anti-Christian liberalism they would not have gone for. Uh, we've also seen since the 1970s uh, with deregulation under, starting with deregulation under Carter, accelerating through the Reagan administration, a dramatic rollback of regulation of business and particularly restrictions on concentrations of power in particular industries. You know, back in the 1980s, most cities had three hometown banks still. And the electric right. utility was locally owned. You may have had a locally owned department store. And now all of those have been rolled up into a handful of national banks. Uh, in industry after industry, there is incredible concentration of ownership and control. There's often a two towers model, CVS and Walgreens, AT&T and Verizon, 
Home Depot mm. and Lowe's. In other industries, you know, there's like a monopoly. In the tech world, there's almost monopolies in many sectors. Uh, in banking, again, massive concentrations repealed the Glass-Steagall Act, which separated commercial and, and um, investment banking. On down the line, and we've reached the point now that, in essence, there's so much concentrated corporate power that the market no longer uh, operates as a meaningful check on corporate behavior. So, you know, there really is no meaningful competition in the airline industry. There's a handful of players, and they're all identical. And it's like this in industry after industry after industry. And it's very difficult for, like, a newcomer to come in and disrupt that industry. And so, as a result, economics have become divorced for taking from taking care of your customer. And this has allowed them to... Uh, you know, business was always kind of tightly linked to the state in ways that we would not like to uh, admit in America. Uh, this goes back a long way. Uh, but now, you know, business and government are, uh, you know, there's much blurrier lines between them. Uh, and, so, and so this is just a list of things that I'm, I'm saying, and you can't say that they all, um, they, they all, uh, you know, directly contributed to it. But today we have essentially a two-tier society in which all of the economic growth and power has been concentrated in the top 20%. There are fewer and fewer institutions controlling all the power. Intermediary institutions and social capital in the subaltern classes has been liquidated by and large. And so, it, and the elite of the country are no longer see Christianity in the form of Protestantism or anything else as part of their identity. Ergo, there's much more freedom for these ideologies to colonize, uh, colonize the elites. And these ideologies are actually quite, uh, quite favorable in many ways to continued control by existing elites. Uh, and, so I'd like to, I'd yeah. like to jump in here a couple, uh, a little bit here, uh, Aaron, these are great observations and pretty heterodox when it comes to sort of movement conservatism, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, regulation could actually, help us as conservatives kind of kind of preserve our way of life and, and so forth. And then in the, even the idea that the liberal Protestant uh, sort of leadership class in the United States was actually uh, contributing to the sort of this ethos that we've lost in a positive way. You know, you know, like I was just looking at uh, Trinity Church in Boston, whose, uh, you know, location there in Copley Square is just like, I mean, can you think of better a better piece of real estate you know, in urban America, the Trinity Church in Copley Square, right, right across from the Boston Public Library, right next to the Hancock and Prudential Towers. And uh, when that thing was built, it was just, if you've ever been in it, it's just a, a magnificent building. It's the most beautiful building there in the center of the city in that, in that area uh, with some very strong competition. And, uh, the, the, you know, the pastor that people remember uh, associated with that is Phyllis Brooks, the guy who was the... Uh, the writer of Oh Little Town of Bethlehem, that hymn. And, mm. uh, uh, but he was kind of a, the, one of the, the, the founding fathers of liberal Protestantism in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a statue of him there <laughs> in Copley Square. I mean, can you imagine that with a cross and a Bible <laughs> and all this stuff? Uh, can, you, can we imagine any clergyman today uh, of, any, of any stripe getting any you know, public uh, sort of recognition in this in this way, um, but I think I think I, I think I like to dig into a little bit with you is this is this concentration of economic power uh, and how that is uh, at work. I think in actually calming us and making us craven. I, I think that uh, we all kind of feel at the mercy right now of these very powerful uh, corporations and. Uh, you know, we, you know, you noted deregulation and a lot of folks look back with real fondness on the 1980s and the Reagan revolution and all that kind of stuff that brought about the deregulation that led to the situation we find ourselves in now. But it's, it's almost as though we, we, we refuse to analyze uh, or make a connection between that period of time, which we think of as like the, you know, sunrise again, or, you know, in America that, you know, that slogan that Reagan used, you know, <laughs> uh, and our, and our, in our situation today, um, uh, can, can you kind of dig into that a little bit more and, and maybe why, why we're so re reticent to make these connections? Well, if you look at both concentration and the digital transformation of commerce, 
what we see is that a handful of companies now have essentially veto power over whether or not you're allowed to participate in economic life in America. When I was a kid in the 80s, most people did not have credit cards in America. I don't think people understand how recent an innovation credit cards were. I'm not sure when uh, Bank of America created Visa, but it may have been in the 1970s. Um, at, at some of it, this was not something there. I don't think I routinely used a debit card for point of sale purchases until the 2010s. It's I just making cash purchases. People wrote people were not buying everything with a credit card or debit card. When debit cards first came out, they weren't really debit cards. They were ATM cards you could use to take cash out of the out of the bank. So right there, two companies, MasterCard and Visa, if they deplatform you as a merchant, which they do to people that they don't like, you can't accept credit cards in your business. Imagine being a business and not being able to accept credit cards. Right. That's it. Yeah. So that's number one. Yeah. Number two, yeah. almost everything that happens from an internet perspective is on mobile device today. And so if you want to start uh, you know, start a you know, company or use digital payments, you have to integrate with either one of two companies, Apple, which makes the iPhone, or Google, which makes the Android operating system, which runs everything that's not an Apple. And so uh, Apple and Google have complete control over what can be done with your phone. And particularly if you have an app, uh, you can be completely deplatformed yeah. very, very quickly. And what you see is in many of these cases, there are just a few dominant players. There's one company called Stripe that is now becoming increasingly dominant as the processor of online payments. If Stripe decides to, to stop accepting your payments, you can't do it. So you start right there, think right there. Apple and Google control whether you can be on a phone. MasterCard and Visa determine whether or not you can uh, accept credit cards, which is tantamount to being in business. There aren't that many banks uh, today. There's not. There are far fewer community banks that can handle it on down. And those banks cannot invest in, in the technology that other people can. So that's just an example right there. The fact that we now, rec- basically all transactions are conducted through credit or debit cards yeah. um, tells you that those two companies, of which there's only two, uh, and they are not regulated like traditional utilities, y- you now have to be able to be completely cut off from the world of commerce if they don't like you. Again, imagine if the electric company could turn off your electricity if they didn't like your politics, right? That that was basically the way we used to look at these yeah, fabric right. of the economy uh, mm-hmm. type of companies. No, the gas company, the electric company, the water company, uh, the telephone company cannot deny service to you unless you don't pay your bill or you're violating the law in some way. There has to be an objective standard. Today, it's not like that. In many, many areas... There are only a handful of providers, and you know if you anger them, then you know you get screwed. And what typically happens today is when there's a firestorm, and one of these companies deplatforms you in rapid order, everybody else deplatforms you uh, yeah. as well. So you find yourself cut off from uh, iPhones, you find yourself cut off from phones, you find yourself cut off from banking, <laughs> you find yourself cut off from you know it could be. C- your domain names could be revoked. You think right. about this, right? You, you think that you own theologypodcast.com <laughs> and one day GoDaddy sends you an email that says, uh, you cannot uh, you cannot have a domain with us anymore. So you have to find somebody else for your domain. And But nobody else will host Theology Podcast either. You could lose the Theology Podcast domain because no domain registrar would do business with you. There's only one domain registrar in the entire world for .coms that's willing to take on unpopular customers. And so, you know, and, and by the way, if you use them, now you have the scarlet letter, right? Yeah, on you, you yeah. know, you are, you know, oh, you're a part of the alt-right or whatever. So right. these handful of companies that control everything, you know, from domain names to whatever, uh, they make it, they make it much riskier and much easier to essentially unperson people, kick them out of the public square uh, you know, kick them out of commerce, uh, et cetera, in ways that simply did not exist 
uh, not that long ago, when most transactions were with cash or checks, there were lots of banks, and it would never occur to a company to simply not do business with a politically unpopular person in most cases. Yeah, I remember, you know, uh, local banking. I, you know, <laughs> I can actually remember local banking, but I remember, you know, my, my first really uh, big uh, kind of play in real estate. Uh, I actually uh, got to know the the uh, senior vice president in terms of commercial lending for this particular town or this particular bank in a town in central Connecticut. We were on, we were on first name basis. Now it just strikes me as that, by the way, that particular bank has, has been swallowed up like four times since then, you know, one, one other bank, bigger bank swallowed them, then a bigger bank swallowed them, bigger bank swallowed, but then so on and so forth. And like, it's just this massive faceless institution now. You know, you don't have a personal relationship with your banker. You know, maybe maybe they they claim you do in some no, television commercial. No, it's it's totally crazy. But you see here, like in Indianapolis, it used to be, and this was everywhere. The president of the biggest bank in town was like a big power broker, probably the most important power broker in the city. Well, today the head of the local largest local bank is just a figurehead installed by J.B. Morgan Chase or Bank of America. Right. It's some middle-level bureaucrat who has no power. Uh, they're not independently wealthy, and they have career aspirations uh, elsewhere. And mm -hmm. as a result, they're never going to rock the boat. They're going to pay right. it very, very, very safe. And so one of the things that you've seen in America and one of the things that you still see in your town is that civic leadership has often become very timid, mm -hmm. uh, and it's very bureaucratic. It's hard to actually get consensus to do things. And the things that they do are things that everybody else are doing because it's safe. And that's yeah, yeah. unlike what you would often see uh, back when there were still a lot of locally owned businesses uh, in these places. Now, let's think a little bit about how people tend to approach this. Uh, I think a lot of folks, and we've talked a little bit about this in a kind of uh, a critical way, uh, take the front porch republic approach. The idea of let's just get a bunch of like-minded people together and kind of form our own little bubble world uh, in the midst of this larger, you know, sort of monstrosity. And uh, we can have, you know, our, our Benedict option, you know, right. here we are. Uh, but can it really happen when you don't have access to credit cards or, or you know, bank, you know, there, there are, the, there are these realities that, that just cannot, cannot be addressed. You know, sometimes people say, well, we need to start our own bank. Well, okay. You, you know what that entails? Uh, I mean, at least if you're going to be a bank in a traditional sense, it's you know, virtually maybe impossible the, to start a financial institution today. Yeah, and that's yeah. one of the reasons that, you know, they love Sarbanes-Oxley and these other act, uh, laws makes it very difficult to, fight back against them. And yes, it's true that very few people have lost access to the credit card system. And I don't know that anyone has lost their ability to open an individual account. I know plenty of people who've been debanked uh, as a business entity, uh, but not. But we see uh, that these tools are increasingly going to be used to control people. We saw yeah. this with the Canadian trucker protest, which yeah, whatever yeah, you think right. of it, what happened what happened with that? The government de declares an emergency and they seize the bank accounts and freeze the bank accounts of anybody who donated to them, anything yeah. there. Digitization and concentration allows people the ability to do things that in past eras they would not have been able to do. And so just as we impose sanctions on regimes overseas that we don't like, say Russia, today – getting debanked, they impose financial sanctions on individuals who are dissidents that the regime does not like domestically as well. And so you yeah. should look at everything that is done internationally. There is a domestic analog of it. And you can be sure that many American power brokers and leaders look at China's social credit score yeah, and yeah. think that is what we need here in a different form. And again, what you often see that conservatives are unable to bring themselves to understand is that just because it's a private company that does it doesn't mean that it's independent of the government or independent yeah. of the regime. You know, in China, you know, the Chinese Communist Party and the government really does run things directly. In America, 
we have a public-private partnership. Uh, it is a hybrid model in which the state and corporations and these other institutions of power, such as the media and the universities, that they collaborate together, mm -hmm. not seamlessly, not without friction, uh, but they collaborate together to accomplish many of the same things. People say that we have, you know, we need to have government-run health care. We need to have public health care. Public, we have it. We have it. The U.S. The government pays for the majority of healthcare costs in America. Healthcare in America is enormously regulated in many ways. The fact that we administer our healthcare through nominally private entities does not disguise that the government is the primary actor in America in driving the healthcare system in many ways. And so, uh, again, other countries may have a more state-directed system, uh, you know, because that's how their their model works. In America, we have a public-private partnership, and you should not view the government and the private sector as truly distinct and adversarial uh, entities. They're very tightly linked in many ways. Yeah, Tom, you had something you wanted to bring up here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there were a couple couple things. Uh, one thing was back in the mentioning of Canada is one of the things you noticed is someone supposedly, a hacker, ends up uh, taking the information and publicly posting it on in public, almost like the way, you know, kind of old scarlet lettering, if you will, right? And, oh, these people don't do business with these people. I mean, shame on them, right? Um but one of the other things you do, I always, you know, it's something uh, Hannah Arendt always reminded me of is looking for the vulnerabilities, right? What happens is there is an immense amount of power, but the, because like you, you mentioned, it's in, a, it's in a small concentration of people, this, this large amount of power. And there is, there is a nervousness there as well, a contingency that when you saw all of these truckers in Canada get together, if they were willing to take that risk further, maybe to die or starve for what they believe, that would have threatened these institutions in that society in ways much larger, although it would have been at a much larger cost to the people who were fighting it. And at this point, it was just over vaccine mandates, I guess. Um, but what happens when a people get boxed in so much that it does become that large? Um, and and how how does having all of this concentration of power, even if they can kind of micromanage everything, eventually protect them if something should go the other direction to where people feel boxed in, they have no alternative in that small percentage with all of its power cannot ultimately dominate the masses. Yeah, but but the, we've also got a small group of people who control the media. Yeah. And so a protest breaks out. Suddenly, they're banned from Twitter. They're banned from Facebook. They're banned from all of these various their, – their cell phones are shut down potentially. You know, all, all of these kinds of things can prevent information from being transferred, which can prevent this from turning into a larger scale problem. I, yeah. I have a few thoughts on that. First, yeah, I think please. the Canadian trucker protest uh, shows, and you could say 1-6 is another example of this. I always tell conservatives, what worked for the left won't work for you. You cannot think that you can affect change through adopting the tactics of the left. Yeah. It doesn't work. Because when Black Lives Matter you know, protesters torture city, <laughs> they are backed by the powers yeah. of society, and there will be no consequences for them. Whereas yeah. if a politically unpopular group without the sanction uh, of the power brokers does something, they're going to be ruthlessly crushed. And yeah. so I think there's this simple naive view that, oh, we live in a democracy. We'll go protest. Yeah. We'll go do these things. And we'll do the exact same things that other people do. Um, you know, I remember when the teachers in Wisconsin occupied the Capitol for like this. Oh, we'll do that. It doesn't work like that. So I think a more sophisticated view uh, needs to be done. But what I would say is, uh, and this is where I get away from the kind of the Benedict option and front porch public approaches. I believe that they, that is fundamentally a cope, that that is a sort of about making peace uh, with the way things are 
And this illusion that we can go regenerate society from the bottom up through reconstructing social capital in little platoons by inviting people over for potlucks on our porch or something <laughs> like that. And what I have noticed is that the people who advocate for that uh, invariably reject any attempts to fundamentally restructure or reform the actual power structures of society. In many cases, they are very explicit about that, that any attempt to change the structures of our society is inherently illegitimate. Patrick Deneen in Why Liberalism Failed is a perfect example of that. He denounces all of the evils of liberalism uh, and what it has wrought, uh, but essentially explicitly says, don't try to replace this with something else. You know, instead, go behave in this neo tocmillian manner. And so how would you go about thinking about restructuring uh, the things of society? And one of the things uh, that many of these protests do accomplish, even though they turn out very poorly for the people in question, is that they drain moral legitimacy out mm -hmm. of the system. It used to be that we could go lecture other countries about censorship yeah. or about suppressing dissent. We have no more moral authority to do that overseas. Yes, the New York Times and the Washington Post can write their editorials and frame their articles all they want. People in other regimes are laughing at us. Yeah. And increasingly, they're even explicitly doing so. The BBC, about a year ago, did an interview with the president of it. Maybe it may have been Azerbaijan. I can't remember the country, but it was one of the Central Asian states. And they're, pro they're going against him. Uh, this BBC reporter is pressing him on his treatment of journalists and dissidents. And he's like, you've got Julian Assange in prison right now. <laughs> right. What about right, what yeah. you are doing to Julian Assange? <laughs> And she's like, well, you know, I didn't do that. I missed it's like, look, you are a state broadcaster. <laughs> Your state right, right. has a journalist in prison right now. Don't come lecture me. And it was the same thing yeah. with the Taliban. When they took over, they made some jab at Facebook. You know, you guys kick people off Facebook all the time. And so I think increasingly, <laughs> increasingly, um, you know, internationally for sure, uh, the the legitimacy, moral legitimacy and moral superiority of the United States in this way of thinking is in dramatic decline. And so forcing people to operate through more overtly coercive means, especially in a society like the United States, where liberty is part of the essential political culture and aesthetic of society, it's very deeply tied to the sense of American identity. Uh, it does delegitimize much of the system in the eyes of other people. Forcing people to rule through force uh, is, is in some expense maybe the step that can be good rather than allowing people to do what Chomsky and Herman and Chomsky used to call manufacturing consent, or all the way going back to Walter Lippmann. That mm -hmm. is, you know, Walter Cronkite can get on TV and the New York Times can write articles and you can have different debates. And all of a sudden it's like, here's the consensus of what we're doing. They used to be able to do that. Yeah. And once you can no longer kind of fake a consensus and it's very obvious that you're sort of making stuff up uh, in the press because there's these alternative uh, channels of information and you're self-evidently censoring people and suppressing dissent, all these like hair splitting about, oh, that's a private company. That's not the government. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, well, I, the White House spokesman was actually asking for these people to be to do suppressed. This. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so right. uh, you know, I think that there, I think there is that that sense in which legitimacy is being drained out of the system, and in the short term, that probably means a more coercive and repressive uh, system. Uh, ultimately, that weakens it in the long term. You know what? What you know? I'm not predicting a collapse or anything of that nature. But, it, you know, a government that has to resort more and more to naked force to accomplish things as opposed to the illusion of consent uh, has really forfeited one of its most powerful kind of powerful pieces of legitimacy. And so I don't think there's going to be any revolutions. I don't think there's going to be any national divorces or anything of that nature. But I do think, in essence, we see the declining moral power. Yeah, and other forms of power of of the government, any anyway, anyways, as they're forced to more and more heavy-handed 
uh, tactics. And again, what we saw with the COVID mandates, yeah, widespread uh, non-compliance, or uh, you know, as my one friend like to call it, Irish democracy, uh, <laughs> is what the system is really not set up to right. uh, to handle that. I mean, it still is basically a system that's predicated on the American conservative, American rule follower who really buys into the system yeah. and thinks that the system is basically fair and that the well, way to solve our problems is to have a protest or to go to the ballot box or to run a better candidate. And if those people decide, well, we're just not going to go along with the system anymore in large numbers, it becomes much, much harder to deal with that. So that, that's a, that was a long aside, but those are some of the ways I would be thinking about what's going on yeah. in the world today. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to I'd like to take this in a couple in a, in, in, a, in a particular direction, but I want to don't want to cut you guys off. So, so Glenn, why don't you uh, say what you're going to say? Yeah, and a, another way of looking at what we do about this, uh, I would argue, is to go back to Machiavelli. Um, what most people don't get about the prince is that Machiavelli was actually an ardent Republican. He believed Florence yes. should be a republic. He served in the Florentine Republic before the Medici. Uh, despotism took over, the later one. And his argument in The Prince is that Florence is and should be a republic, but it's a sick republic. The people lack virtue, and all republics need virtue if they're going to survive. So his argument is that the Medici need to take over, rule as ruthlessly as they need to, to maintain their power, but they should also rebuild the institutions in society that will produce virtue in the populace. And then when they die or retire, they can get everlasting glory, which is what all despots are after, by becoming the founder of the new Florentine Republic, the new revitalized Florentine Republic. So in other words, the, 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 the key here is that he argued that Florence wasn't really capable of being a republic, but the way to turn to make it capable was to build institutions that will inculcate virtue in the populace. Now, I don't think we're going to see the government doing that, but that's something that we can be doing as, uh, you know, the, again, the, the, well, I know you're not, I'm going to push back a little bit on your, your thing about the little platoons there. I think that that's an important starting point. Well, there's got to be some sense in which uh, you've got the, the despot, uh, sort of defending the little platoons, at least. Uh, and that's what we don't have right now. But uh, uh, Tom, uh, you had something? No, I, I think that his was just a, a extended answer of, I think, the same point uh, Arendt was making, just in terms of one, once one begins to lose that moral legitimacy um, and people are no longer opted into something, it becomes it becomes something that the normal engines of trying to push harder and harder uh, don't end up accomplishing what they want. And so I think as Aaron suggested, um, you see the fallout of that and you see what's a lot of the, the kind of um, options are available once that happens. But I think just from my encounter of institutions and students in relationship to them and the, the conversations I hear, I increasingly hear more and more people losing confidence in those institutions because of the extremes things have been going to. And these are even people that wouldn't be considered conservatives. They are starting to really um, see, see extremities um, that they had no idea were, were kind of uh, under the surface here in, in our leadership classes. So I'll end with that. As I like to say, the decline of trust in institutions isn't the problem. It's yeah. the solution. Most yeah. of our institutions are actually still too trusted relative to the amount of trust that they deserve. They're not competent. They're not functioning well. Yeah. Um, now, that's not to say every institution is like that, but the Wall Street Journal just had two articles exploring the decreasing reliability of our electric grid and how the number of people installing generators and backup power systems <laughs> has gone up by a factor of 10 in like the recent decades. And to me, that's like we're literally becoming a third world country where the power doesn't stay on all the time. Now, we're not quite there. That's hyperbole. But when more and more people, including homeowners and people who own pizza places, okay, we're not talking about hospitals and data centers here, say, 
it's actually worth it on a cost benefit basis for me to install generators <laughs> because of all these power outages I'm taking. That is pretty much what they do in third world countries. They're like, I have to supply my own power needs. And so, uh, yeah, I do think that there, there's a decline and you could look at the, you know, the Roman empire, people see it in decline. You can see the decline, but what do you do about it? Yeah, that's um, right. Now, what I would say is I'm not, I'm not necessarily a declinist, uh, because if you put some perspective on it, America has gone through periods where it seems like our day was done many times. In the 1970s, a lot of people thought it was game oh, yeah. over, lights out, uh, you know, especially for the cities, you know, the blackouts right. in New York, taxi driver, all that stuff. I mean, people thought right. New York was done. Look at New York today. A lot of times we think it's all because of some great leader like Giuliani who came in or something like that. And surely there's some of that. But sometimes the world just changes. Uh, right. You know, it was like I go back to 69. Uh, was it Kent State in 69? I can't remember exactly yeah, what it was, but yeah. it was like 69 was like all the worst of the worst yeah, in terms of campus yeah. protests and all that. 1970s, 1970, protests just sort of evaporated. It just went away yeah. overnight. So things change uh, whether we do anything or not. And just assuming that things go on a catastrophic track uh, is – uh, you know, not always warranted. And that's why I think, you know, we we should be willing to contest for the future of the country because I don't think that America is done by any means. Uh, I think that there's still a lot of reasons to think that we could end up in a, a better place, you know, uh, 15, 20 years from now. Is it going to look like what it did in the 80s or the 50s? No, it's not. Is it going to have every element that I would probably want to put in it? No, but, you know, maybe we'll have a more competent government. It's hard. It's easy to imagine that we might fix some institutional issues, that things might get better in some way, that maybe we'll deal with some of this concentrated corporate power. Uh, you know, who knows? Um, who knows? But I think it's certainly possible and we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't overly invest in a declinist future either. Mm -hmm. So I'd, this would be a good way to, a good point to sort of transition into the other, other article you you wrote. We don't have a whole lot of time, maybe, maybe 10 minutes at the most, but um, in that other article, you you uh, were promoting a kind of tough-minded uh, pastorate, uh, and the idea I think uh, that you uh, are critiquing is sort of this uh, uh, kind of uh, yeah, a sort of approach to ministry that just is sort of stuck in positive world or even neutral world, and hasn't really come to embrace negative world as the reality in which. We find ourselves today and that consequently we need to have a kind of tough mindedness like, like we see in the Apostle Paul. You know, I've never I've never even seen anyone address this. I've been in a lot of settings where we're uh, vetting candidates for the ministry and not once has anyone ever brought up tough mindedness <laughs> as being a virtue that would be uh, a helpful, let alone necessary. Uh, for a pastor to possess. So related to some of these things that we've been talking about, can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit, uh, Aaron? Sure. This is another one that probably dates back to 2013 or 14 or 15, somewhere in there. Um, you know, as I was reformulating my thinking on, on men and masculinity, I did a study of Second Timothy, which I really thought was, uh, and, and is, do still do think, is sort of the paradigmatic tract on manhood in the Bible in many ways. It's this letter from last will and testament, basically, from father to son, Paul writing to his young protege, Timothy. And one of the things that really jumped out at me is just how physically and mentally tough Paul was. I mean, they stoned him and left him for dead outside the city. When yeah. you think about a guy who survives being stoned, <laughs> uh, that guy was tough, tough. And I think a lot of times we'll read 2 Corinthians 11, and we'll talk about, Paul's talking about his weakness. He's presenting it as weakness, yeah. but he's not totally presenting it as weakness. <laughs> There's a subtext there that's like, you know, I went through a lot here. Yeah. And you, you listen to that, um, it's very powerful. Now, in a place like China, where Christian pastors are regularly imprisoned, as Paul was in 2 Timothy and other places, that sort of physical trial uh, looms large. Uh, in, I think, how they need to think about their lives. Because, you know, when you might end up in jail, you you better be kind of physically tough and able to handle that kind of physical hardship. That's not the case here in the United States today, thankfully. But 
you know, mental and emotional strains of the type that Paul had. And he talked about his worry for all the churches and all the worry for people getting led into sin and all of what he had to go through uh, and all the different disputes and debates and false teachers and everybody's going up against. That sort of thing is much more true today. There is a higher degree of stress uh, put on pastors, and they need to be much more mentally and emotionally tough and resilient than they may have had to in the past. Uh, you know, there's there's no avoiding conflict today. I viewed some of these trends I see in the church. You know, I see James Davis and Hunter's faithful presence uh, concept, or this sort of depoliticization, political disengagement. People uh, sort of promote these days maybe a more kind of Anabaptist kind of approach to the world. I see those as conflict avoidance strategies functionally. What do I need to do to avoid conflict? Well, if you're a pastor today, you can't avoid conflict. Mm -hmm. Tell people you're going to meet in person, you're going to get attacked. Tell them you're not going to meet in person, you're going to get attacked. Require (laughs) masks, you're going to get attacked. Don't require masks, you're not going to get attacked. You know, start preaching about race, you're going to get attacked. Don't preach about race, you're going to get attacked. There's no avoiding this conflict. There's no avoiding it. And therefore, you know, that's going to be characteristic of this negative world. And I, I position this piece within that framework by saying, okay, if it's true that society has become more negative towards Christianity, and if it's if the sociological analysis I had of the various intra-evangelical conflicts, which we don't need to get into, are correct, what are the implications of that? What would that predict about the world? One prediction would be there will be more conflict and more stress and more strain on pastors, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Surveys from Barna and others are showing significant increases in the number of people uh, thinking about leaving the ministry. Major media outlets like the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, they're writing these articles, The Atlantic, about how difficult ministry is, exodus of the clergy, shortage of clergy. And so this is why this negative world concept, although it doesn't necessarily tell us what to do and it isn't as equally clear in every area, does have practical implications for how we do ministry. And one of them is, if you want to go into the ministry, you better be prepared for conflict. You better be prepared for stress. And you need to be thinking about structuring your life and your ministry to make you as resilient as possible in the face of that. You know, I'd like to make a quick comment here uh, related to this, and that is, traditionally, uh, you know, guys have uh, looked to their colleagues as a uh, sort of buffer or maybe as a, a kind of a, a network of people who are supportive uh, for dealing with conflict. But those very settings now are themselves some of the most conflict sort of uh, sort of uh, sort of filled uh, in a in a pastor's life. You know, so like when I think about my my uh, participation in my denomination, I don't think about my denomination is a place where I get away from conflict. <laughs> I think of I think of it as a place where I'm experiencing some some of the most significant conflict in my life, and um, you know, in light of that, uh, I think that uh, we're going to see more and more kind of affinity networks sort of replacing uh, denominational networks as being sort of the significant uh, way or a significant means by which pastors uh, weather these storms. Because for me, uh, Presbytery is not uh, a a place to get away from the world. (laughs) It's a place where I actually encounter the world, uh, you know, speaking through my colleagues in ministry. And uh, anyway, just just Well, that's true, and that's already occurring. Uh, Denominations are structuring and restructuring themselves to be affinity group-based. The Reformed Church in America created a non-geographic uh, classes called the city classes that huh. had all of these progressive urban churches now have their own club where they can do whatever they want. And it's in the Anglican church in North America, there are many non-geographic dioceses yeah. uh, that have different affinities in them. Now, whether these people can remain within a single denominational structure with these affinity groups, I think that's very uh, open question, but we're already seeing it uh, happen. And I think there's also a sort of resorting that's going to be going on. Is this, there going to be much more sorting of people uh, between churches, between denominations, and maybe once the resorting is done a little bit or, or further advanced, 
um, then some of these conflicts will, uh, in, you know, conflicts within the local church will go away a little bit. And I think about this uh, a lot. Uh, you know, one of the people I've used as an example uh, of ministry for the negative world, although I don't endorse everything that he says, is Doug Wilson. Uh, and so I think there's a lot, a lot of people don't like Doug. I like Doug. And yeah. I think that they've been very, um, you know, although I, you know, I still think in many ways, I classify them as positive world uh, because they're very much in a culture of war mindset. Uh, and I think that causes them some problems that they didn't need to have. They don't need to have, uh, but they have really, one of the things that they've done that's very intelligent among many things that they've done that's very intelligent. Right. They should be studied uh, as a model uh, yeah. is that they filter for unity around what they're doing. And so yeah. Doug's blogging becomes this polarizer that attracts the like-minded and repels people who don't think the same as him. And therefore they don't have these sort of big tent church and not as much of a big tent church. Right. 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 And um, it becomes very difficult for people who don't agree with him uh, to say, well, I'm going to go there and I'm going to change what they're doing because then you got to tell all your friends you attend Doug Wilson's church, <laughs> you know? And so I think they've really set it up that, you know, I, I think the aesthetics and the structures of that are very powerful. And a lot of times today, you know, there's this idea that we want to have all as much kind of inclusiveness and diversity, you know, within churches as possible, you know, that the, it should be every, and there's, there's definitely ways in which that's true. And I do think that the church needs to be open to everybody and needs to be welcome, welcoming to people. But there should also be, a, I think, for this negative world, much more, um, much more selecting for unity uh, in who you want to attract to your church. And what are the things that we want to be unified around? Yeah. And if you don't select for unity around the things that you think are important, you're going to end up in a lot of strife. Um, yeah. and so, you know, there may be, just, there's a lot of things that aren't important it doesn't matter if you're, there's a lot of disagreement or diversity on those points, but about the things that you think are important, you better select for unity around those. And that's where I think a lot of these churches are going to get themselves in trouble, particularly a lot of these urban cultural engagement churches yeah. is that they, they're places that want to be theologically conservative, but essentially culturally progressive in many respects. And you see them becoming much more culturally progressive and so I think that that sets them up for a structural conflict around their theology at some point. Yeah, that's probably a good place to, to land the, the, the plane here. We're, we've gone a little bit over our normal uh, time, but it's been a very rich conversation. And uh, Aaron, as we wrap up, is there any way that uh, people can follow you that you can recommend uh, here in the last minute or so? Yeah, again, sign up for my newsletter, aaronren.substack.com, A-A-R-O-N-R-E-N-N.substack.com. Uh, there's podcasts and other things that I do, but it basically all filters through there. So uh, that's the Central HQ. Well, thanks a lot, Aaron. It's been great to have you. We'll have to have you back again uh, in the not-too-distant future because there are some things that would be great to follow up on. Anyway, thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. We appreciate your support. We have a number of people who give to us on a monthly basis, and we're very grateful for that. And uh, anyway, uh, I should wrap it up here. We should wrap it up here. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.